drain it off and then I think they're kind of prepared for a big spring. The modern contraption, Ted. It's a pretty nice rig you got, Orb. Well guys, we're back here at the Warburton Ranch, Redneck Village, Paris, America. We've been getting lots of questions from y'all about how to create and maintain better turkey habitat on your property. And our farm is right about 100 acres. If y'all have been watching our videos, you've seen us killing some turkeys on this place over the years. But we've seen fewer and fewer turkeys probably in the last seven or eight years, which is what a lot of people are seeing in many parts of the country. Folks are wanting to get involved and figure out how to help turkey habitat which is why you guys are here. That's right. Because yeah. I don't know what in the hell I'm doing. <laughs> Hopefully you guys can shed some light on the subject here at the farm. Yeah, for sure. You know, that's part of Matt and I's business. We, you know, we do a lot of work for whitetail, whitetail guys, but there's a lot of people really focusing on turkeys now. So, well, let's get back here. See if we can learn something. What do you say, Ted? Let's do it. All right, we just got up here. We're gonna head back through the food plot and check out the old farm. Look for a shed out here, Ted. Hey, is that where you got that buck on the scrape right there? Right there. Double ladder. There you go. Hey, they do exist. <laughs> You know how you'll get a gobbler, sometimes he'll hang up in a spot and he'll just be hammering there for a long period of time because he's real comfortable? That doesn't happen in these woods. They'll gobble on the roost and then they'll fly down and you won't hear a turkey gobble for 30 minutes. And he's moving through it. Yeah, and you're getting ready because he's about to pop out in this food plot and gobble or he's gonna gobble right before he gets to it. To me, the classic where he flies down and he's like, I'm not strutting, I'm not really gobbling. I just gotta get through this. He already heard a hen up here, me up here yakking, and he knows this is a spot where he hears hens all the time and sees hens all the time. It's just kind of a community area. Mm -hmm. Kind of brings up the term that we use a lot is usable space. Yeah. We didn't come up with that, but at that time of the year, what does the bird need? He needs to display his dominance and he's coming to an area where he can do that. Yeah. And that CRP when it's tall and rank, that's not usable for that activity. Right. This is. So he's gonna come through here, he's not gonna spend much time in that thick woods. Mm -hmm. He's coming to these openings and spending the majority of his time here. Yeah. But can we take that line of thinking and say, okay, expand it across an entire year. What else do the turkeys need? What else do deer need? We want every acre in here to be usable for something at some portion of the year. Yeah. So when we evaluate right that. Now, right now we're talking about hunting strategy. The disturbance right. that they need when they're strutting and almost like a lecking behavior of prairie chickens, what we yeah. always think of, but they need those at short areas to strut around and move around. But then to produce more, we have to get into brood rearing habitat. Habitat that's conducive for a hen to have a successful nest and then raise those young poults into adult turkeys later on. And that's where much of the landscape is missing that feature. Good news is there's a few little tips and tricks, things that we'll use some disturbance projects that could really change this place rather quickly. Mm -hmm. Good. The dotted cedar, that's fine. I don't care about that. Fire will eventually get it most likely. If not, the chainsaw will. And then you have the fescue base. But we really got a problem with us fescue and yes i mean it, it, it's a, it's in a lot of places a lot of your open areas are dominated by the cool season non-natives smooth brome yeah. and fescue but it's an easy thing to get rid of okay yeah. it's just intentional and timing with an herbicide application and then you can change what's going to be grown here for many many years to come but just think of it like a blanket like it's just laid across the ground itself blocking the seed bank because with it being cool season it's the first thing to green up and it's a mat forming grass so it kind of blocks and inhibits a lot of your other natives from growing that are more warm season come later in the spring it, ultimately one of the biggest things you can do since it's you know you don't have a whole crew of guys it's small small manpower but you want big results and fire is going to really help that okay so you can manage 50 acres in a day with fire with yeah. three guys so and then if you break that up even more then from a spatial component you have different regen in close proximity to each other, almost like a patch patchwork design. And that's exactly what turkey poults need when they're young. Mm -hmm. Lots of um, high protein insects out in these open areas, but you don't get that diversity when you just have fescue as your base. You don't attract nearly the insects with fescue or smooth brome as you would with, uh, you know, ragweed or, Correct. 
you know there's a couple little native sunflowers in here or goldenrod all those are attracting a bunch of insects but so those are great for turkeys and deer yeah oh, exactly well i've noticed that even... i mean you think about like the buck nest in iowa those those bottom fields and stuff that are fallow but mm -hmm. most of that is ragweed it's a bunch of that native grass that's out there that's like this high in like broadleaf weeds and all yeah, sorts of stuff weeds. and like you yeah. were saying about the clumps that was i've talked to you guys about that spot before about how it, like yeah. it's one of the best buck bedding areas i've ever seen literally mm -hmm. there was 15 bucks mm -hmm. in that spot in early october in one night yeah wow. and that's what it is is it's clumps yeah out there and there's so many different plant communities in it but i never thought about that really for turkeys but man if you could recreate that then yeah. you kind of had the best for if you were both. trying to get it for turkeys then you would say okay let's fragment this up and let's carve out a uh, an eighth of this and burn it mm -hmm. or burn this corner and this corner okay and yeah. then next year we're going to burn this corner and that corner and then next year we're going to burn more in the interior so you've got this like four year regrowth and so it's constantly getting disturbed and even a spot this small i mean how big is this a quarter acre not even that eighth this is worth burning coming no, in and burning it this may be little part spot. of the whole unit yeah, you may go from a bigger unit yeah okay. but it's worth including this in that bigger unit i see Absolutely. ultimately like take the edge of the crp to the north take the line we came in on the east take the creek draw right here as your western boundary and then make a hand line up through here that's basically like a goat trail uh -huh. that you're burning so, off of so this whole unit right here gets burned of. sure just this wood block here and then and then you burn maybe the crp unit or portion of the crp unit the year prior okay so then you got regeneration that's a year so old just have, coming yeah. into this you've one. staged it out absolutely yeah okay so predominantly our woods are hickories yeah a lot of that's hickories a main component yeah and yeah. they're not doing much good right now they're they're ultimately crowding out all the other beneficial species that could be growing and they're also crowding out your oaks your oaks aren't making as many acorns sure so we're kind of they're just pretty well robbing you guys what you just said to me um 50 to 100 pounds yes that's, so explain that to... real quick because i can't do it in an <laughs> articulate way so university of tennessee research uh, 50 to 100 pounds produced in a closed canopy forest like we have here per acre per year an adult deer eats about 2,000 in so, a year in a in year a, over the course of a year 150 pound deer so i think pounds. in most parts of the country you have more than one deer or you've got a pretty good deer herd around here i'm sure so it would take a lot of acres of this to feed any kind of deer sure but, and here's the kind of the magic of it all right you can take that same closed canopy acreage that same research showed that in a young forest standpoint so if we come in here and you cut you turn it back into a young forest to change the age of that that same acre can produce a thousand pounds of food so it's within 10 what times. time what, what amount of time three four year time frame you're, okay. you're increasing every single year that food component and then you come back in and reset with fire and so then you, you maintain it with fire it. it's 1500 pounds okay yeah. So you start doing a couple of acres of that across the landscape. Not only have we helped improve the bedding aspect and have more defined bedding, but now we're providing more and more resources for deer to forage on as well as cover so they can survive a year. Maybe make it from a two and a half year old to a three and a half year old. All those things come into play. So, And you're just talking about doing this in small sections. Like right behind the camera and Ted right now, we got a couple acres of this yeah. ridge. We're, we're talking anywhere from half acre. We've done some as big as three, but somewhere in that, and that all is dependent upon the lay of the land. Right. But here it would be half, three quarter. Yeah. I would, Most I'd guys envision. down south know the benefit of a clear cut and how, oh man, you hunt oh, around yeah. those cuts. Oh yeah. But when it's a 50 acre clear cut, it's hard to define where the deer are coming and going and they may just stay. And they may not way. even leave that. But cut. if you do it in a three acre unit, <clears throat> now we can really define, okay, I'm on the downwind side. Like I know they're going to cruise through here at some point. Mm -hmm. When you kind of break the landscape down and you kind of apply just real numbers and real value to it, you kind of quickly see, wow, we're operating on a, if, if the, the majority of a property is closed canopy, it's not offering a lot. Because right. Right? there's real numbers that science has said, okay, this is the value from a forage standpoint. It doesn't really factor in the cover, but we know that closed canopy versus young forest that's been cut, there's way more cover and food now on those acres. So it's with a grocery our, store with empty shelves. Sure. It's closed canopy forest. Makes sense. So our neighbor right over there, 200 yards away, did all that cutting. Yeah. He's going to have 
more pounds per acre here in the next year or two. Mm -hmm. You can quickly see how he could outcompete you on the deer herd. And yeah, well, yeah. luckily we he lets us go over there and we let him come over here. There you go. It's kind of uh, it's a really sweet neighborhood actually. That's cool. I mean, like all of our neighbors are like that. It's like, hey Gary, we got a bird hammering over there. Can we go after him? He's like, yeah, nobody's in there. Go kill him. It's pretty great. Really. <laughs> when you got good neighbors and they work together. <laughs> Had the same neighbors for how long? Since before we were born. I don't know any different ones. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's rare these days. Yeah. Let me see. Kiss your tears <laughs> Yeah. What do you got in your hands there? Uh, many different forms of native plants that are beneficial in some way or another to the wildlife. I know what that is. Yeah, <laughs> of course you do. I don't know a thing or two about that. And everybody's like, what? How is that beneficial? But the amount of insects that the milkweed can attract can feed turkeys, as well as provide a little bit of cover for a young turkey poult. So that's really the, the big benefit there. Sometimes, I'm sure you guys, when you're picking it, can see it just loaded up with different types of bugs. Yeah. So that's, that's one that is commonly scattered across this landscape um, and probably become more common as we start burning more. So you'll probably see it more regularly. The next one is beggar's lice, as most people know it. You probably have picked many of those off your pants. Triangle stickies. Incredibly beneficial from a forage standpoint to deer. It attracts insects, it's a forb. And then we have the seed pods for wintertime forage. Then of course, goldenrod attracting a lot of insects, pretty good structure. Um, you see it a lot in old fields or CRP areas. And then this is personally one of my favorites. Matt's got some seeds there in his hand that you guys can see, but this is called Illinois bundle flower. It usually follows disturbance. You can find it a lot of road ditches. Puts a pretty little bloom, attracts a lot of insects. So that's turkey food with the insects, as well as forage during the uh, winter months with that seed. And the other thing that- Legume, just like soybeans. So it's just a small soybean pod that you didn't have to pay for. This would be more beneficial as well if there was not so much grass component and rank grass underneath yeah. of this. This is a nice, like, if you will think of like an umbrella, well, that protects turkey poults or quail chicks when they're young, Running right? up They'd underneath. Up underneath. Yeah. But they can't do that when there's grass. So this is great to see that it's a component of this field. There's a seed bed there. But they'll, this will be more useful after this is burned. The major problem it looks like that we got here is this. Yeah. In this CRP. Which is extremely common. I and mean, th this is something we see oh, yeah. all the time. Fescue. This is, fescue. This is something that, I mean, you can list out why are the turkeys declining and everybody's got an answer and everybody's right in some capacity but ultimately the landscape is changing it's not only changing from a habitat and plant community um, list but it's also changing because it's more conducive in a lot of the aspects to predators like raccoons oh we've got more bobcats on that camera up there and raccoons than i've ever yeah. seen and we run we've ran that camera up there in that food plot every year in the same spot all year for 15 years yeah. and just in the last five six years we have consistently gotten more and more pictures of predators we'll yeah. probably see rats moles rabbits and everything darting out of this once this is burned yeah but that thatch load is also holding them too which is then attracting predators so sure. by incorporating fire into this on a routine method you know every three four years you might see some of that reduce. When, I mean, when do you think was the last time that was burned? Ten years ago. Ten probably years. probably ten years ago. A, we burned this entire field, too, ago? when we did that. Ten years ago was the last time it burned? Yeah, I think it's been that, close to ten years. That would years. be one of your largest reasons why the turkeys are gone. Sure. It's because sense. it's just too grown up. Like, yeah. your woods are starting to grow up with buckbrush and, uh, and understory things that aren't as beneficial as some of the other ones we've talked about. And then your your open areas are are incredibly grown Which is out. why you see a decrease in turkeys, but yet an increase in the deer activity. Sure, makes yeah. sense. And there's good species out there. Absolutely. They just have to be freed, and you guys can see it. This is what we're talking about. Yeah. I mean, it makes perfect sense after these guys explain it. Quail and turkeys and stuff can't get through that. I mean, and that's everywhere, like you said. But you also mentioned not only burning, but spraying that at some point, right? Yes. Burning is not going to kill fescue or smooth brome. Okay, that's an important thing to talk about, I think. It's totally. suppressing it during okay. that year, but it's not removing it. So a herbicide application 
is, is really system. needed. And, and you know, we can have the debate, ah, herbicide, no herbicide, but ultimately we know that these non-natives aren't benefiting the wildlife like we want them to. So we could try to suppress it with fire, but it's always going to be here. It's just trying to push it back. We, I just want to get rid of it. And right. that's where a herbicide treatment, usually one time or two times. When do you do that? Uh, when it's green, you can do it depending on the herbicide you use. You could do a dormant, or a, when most of the native species are dormant, do kind of a, a March or April application of glyphosate when this is really green. Or you can wait and burn it and then hit it with a grass specific herbicide to kill that. And most of the natives are still dormant because it's uh, the soil temperature is so low that it hadn't started growing. So yet. you could do that now, you're saying? Uh, when this greens up. So another month, you could probably spray the gly uh, gly glyphosate on the fescue and smooth brome and get rid of it. And, it, and glyphosate is just killing that or is it killing everything That's else? Broad, yes, it's a broad spectrum herbicide. It's important to note that it, if there's something green and you spray it with glyphosate, it's gonna it's kill gonna it. Die. Right. But that will be the only thing really green out here at that at that phase of the growing season. So you have to be very strategic about when you yeah. do this. Yes. And is there any resources out there for people where they can they either learn to do it or they can pay somebody to do it or? Yeah, for sure. Learning it and, you yeah. know. Our podcast. <laughs> yeah. Our podcast. It's a little oh, shameless like plug. Yeah. Uh, you know, another University of Tennessee, Dr. Craig Harper, talks a lot about this and he's got great research with it. So, yeah. All those species I picked up, those are here. So, all we have to do is get rid of this and we'll have more of those beneficial species. Short term quick fix then is burning and that's stuff that you've got to keep up on over yeah. time. But if you want more of a long-term fix, you need to burn and then spray this. Yeah. Or spray ahead of it, then follow up. Once this is killed and this is dead and thatch, you can burn it then. Burn it then. Another thing we may talk about is, you know, if we burn, if we're able to burn today or tomorrow, great. But then we come back like in March, and it's like, okay, we've got one burn unit. Now this is green. Spray it in early March, and then roll in two weeks later. Once this is got into the roots and killed the roots, then we burn that. So we've got something that was burned in February, then something that was burned in March. Okay. So we get the best of both worlds. If you haven't burned this in 10 years, that's like the biggest blinking red light. Now we have a problem in what, where your turkeys have gone. Yep. The place has gotten too grown up. Yeah, and we've already, as you can see, we've already got the fire brakes kind of prepared. We've got like a fire break through the middle of it, yep. just a mowed path. I don't know if it'll jump that or not because it ain't very wide. You know, if we have three, three sections, so one of these gets burned every year, and then you may have three sections in the timber, so one of those gets burned every year. Gotcha. Then you may have three sections over on the other CRP field, that, so you burn in one of these sections every year, three different units. And then you just stagger that out in almost a checkerboard effect, and now we've got brood rearing where it's burned and nesting right where it was burned last year, or nesting where it was, and then that's more beneficial to deer. The brood rearing areas we just burned are better summer forage for the deer, so they've got more food, forbs, more food, so. If you didn't have the equipment, or if you didn't have the means to do it, you could contact the NRCS, yeah. and they could come out, because they've come out here and helped us do stuff in the mm -hmm. past. Yep. Yeah. And there's other, I'm sure there's other practices. Quail Forever, Quail Pheasants Forever, forever. Yeah. yep. A lot of nonprofits are, are providing good resources for that. It can be intimidating, oh, I don't even know where to start. Then you start burning and all of a sudden you see a flock of turkeys in there a week or two later and you're like, wow, that's really cool. Then you just start catching on fire yeah. metaphorically and you're just like, let's go hammer out more stuff. So yeah, it's exciting. Sweet. Well, let's go eat and light some stuff on fire, I guess. Cool, let's do it. My name is County Joint Communications. Yes, I was calling to confirm a prescribed fire. Good tool. Good tool. I look like I'm doing something now. Well, it's, a good, it's a good lean post. We're fixing to light this thing ablaze, I guess. The boys yeah. got all their tools with them. It fit everything that you guys got that's real important. It fits right in the back of a pickup. That's right. We like that's... to keep it simple, but but you can be really effective with these same tools. Yep. Drip torch, blower, chainsaw, chainsaw, rakes, rakes, walkie talkie. Hardened. Clothing. It's not the most stylish stuff, but it works. And we called the fire department. And we called the fire department because apparently you need to do that before you light stuff on fire. <laughs> Have the proper gear. Don't wear up polyesters or rubber boots. That would not be a good idea. 
Oops. <laughs> and you really want leather gloves, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and <Oops>. the trifecta. <laughs> yeah, here's your, here's your average redneck. Yeah. <laughs> Winds out of the north. We're going to start here. We advise always to kind of plan out, have a burn plan in place. And so typically we like to use backing fires and start on the downwind side um, for your fire. But in this case, the terrain lays north to south. So we know if we use that wind direction as a, let's go and burn, start on the south side, we would start a head fire that was coming up the hill. We don't want to do that because the biggest part of our CRP is to the north. So because we have a north wind, we're going to start on this north side of the section and because it's a north south, uh, north going to south burn unit. So we're gonna start here, let it back down the slope. We've got clear blue skies, which is a great fire condition. We got, I would say, what, five, eight mile an hour wind, something like yeah. that. Nothing too gusty, pretty consistent, and um, called the fire department. And so with this site fuel condition, I think we're ready to rock. Sweet. Yeah, and that back fire break down there's got snow on it still, it's so snow, right, it's should keep it slope. from going into the... Even tent. if it jumped and went into the woods, the woods still have a lot of snow and wet, so we should be good to go. Yeah, it's doing good, isn't it? Yeah. It's, I mean, fires like this are just prime. You're just gonna slowly back your way down. So if you're a small private landowner like us and you're trying to find help to do this in your area. Yeah, a cooperative is, a, is like a group of private landowners working together to manage a bigger piece. Okay. So if you have a bunch of neighbors and you form, let's say 2,000 acres, there's grants in the state that you can apply, I think with the Missouri Prescribed Fire Council, and get a trailer full of all this gear and you can start burning on each other's properties and working together to for the better of the of the habitat so that makes sense match did you set. just find a match set match set spiker you did Where's find a match set holy cow wasn't even in the burn <laughs> <laughs> we drove over it this morning We're driving right over it wow isn't that something on our defense go ahead hard. man they're all yours no you got it man i, don't I can't want pick, pick up someone else's set that's a good set of rattling horns for the ozarks <laughs> man ted look at that mm. that's a good one here you go ted can you make something cool with him it's our lucky I'm day make some chopsticks out of him there you go <laughs> we just got done burning yep and we got a little bit of daylight left Yep, well, we're going to try to run a saw for a little bit of the day before it gets dark. Really trying to capitalize on, typically you talk about they're bedded that way. Hmm. Off the property. Off the property, the and so, location. you know, if a deer is getting up, there's a chance that it's nocturnal more than daylight. Yeah. So we're trying to bring, bring it in tighter, get them bedding a little closer. This little area out here, this little knoll, kind of west facing slope, might get a little bit better during uh, November on into December for bedding. So we're gonna go in there. We have a pretty good idea. We're gonna run into a bunch of hickories. We're just gonna start cutting some trees, trying to put some vegetation down. Temper, like immediately, we got some trail cameras. We're gonna see how quickly the deer come in there and start eating on some of the forage, some of the buds that are way up in the tree. We bring them down to deer level, deer food. This might get a little thick for turkeys right out of the gate. We sent a couple fires through here. Now we get a lot more herbaceous growth. Uh, and it's more conducive for nesting or budding and loafing. Uh, I said Bugging. budding. Bugging. Deer are going to eat the <laughs> buds and the turkeys are going to eat the bugs. And so you're going to cut this now and burn yeah. it next year? Pro probably, yeah. Okay, yeah. got you. Since it's right next to this burn unit, burn this timber next year. See what happens. Sweet. Go let some light in. We got some oak component in here. Try and release some of those up top. It's gonna let a little bit more light in, but once we roll off this slope, then get a little bit more aggressive so it's not gonna interfere with access getting up there. And they're gonna be, you know, a hill in between you and them, and then not slide that way because you're gonna be coming straight up through there as well. well. Basically, the difference is gonna be, this is gonna be a little bit more just cutting these trees lower to the ground, flush, so they're laying flat, and we're releasing these oaks. Technique called crop tree release. So these produce more acorns. Matt is gonna get down there and cut a little heavier, mix in some hinge cuts, so that's more conducive for deer bedding. This is more 
Uh, they'll still bed here most likely with the plant response. Let's get after it. If you notice a lot of mine, I'm cutting off six inches above the ground. Most of the trunks are laying flat against the ground. But you can start seeing a little bit more blue sky when you look up, and I've only ran the saw for 10 minutes, maybe. We're trying to really promote young white oaks. Right now, they don't stand a chance under all the hickories that are shading out the ground. So we gotta open it up, hopefully get some new white oak regeneration, get some more herbaceous plants, and in the meantime, have that immediate benefit to more conditioned deer bedding, as well as improved nesting and brood rearing areas, even within our timber. This is what I say when we're running TSI. A lot of the trees we cut, even if we left them for 50 years, they're still a 50 year old hickory. Really doesn't amount to anything. We're just cutting weeds. It's like going out in the garden and pulling weeds. But if we cut it, we get the structure and we also get the forage immediately from the buds as well as the stump sprouts. Deer numbers are generally high in this part of the world, so they'll probably take care of a lot of the stump sprouts. We're benefiting many species here, and don't even get me started on summer tanagers. It's a little red bird, likes woodlands, so all the times you're doing TSI, they're just all over it. Not to nerd out or anything. <laughs> You guys really opened it up in here though. Like I know this is gonna get thick. Yeah. Right along this edge anyway. And that's the whole goal, right? We talked about earlier today is maximizing sunlight. Where are you gonna put sunlight to spur on new regeneration? And this is west and south facing slope. So right. we're gonna get quite a bit of sunlight into this timber unit. It's going to increase the amount of growth here. And so with the structure of the treetops on the ground, incorporation of hinges, the flush cuts, this is gonna get thick. Deer are going yeah. to be in here bedding for sure. What's the biggest difference between the flush cuts and the hinge cuts then? What do you gain? You can ultimately see whatever. where he cut with mostly hinge cuts or a lot of hinge cuts versus where I cut. And you can see that most of the stuff I cut's laying pretty well flat on the ground. Right. So it's generally that that's going to hopefully release those oaks. Not getting as much sunlight because I didn't, of course, I cut the big oaks to open it up. But that's more preferred for just general TSI, timber stand improvement. We're trying to encourage a new young forest, but we don't necessarily want to make a thicket. So that's more conducive for turkeys immediately. And this is more conducive for deer immediately, but both of them have their benefits. And, and right now, immediately, there's a height and structure difference offered if you flush cut and incorporate some hinges into that. So that's really why on a unit like this, where we know we're gonna get a lot of sunlight and really we want deer to be bedded at, we're gonna incorporate more hinges and hammer the canopy, really open it up versus what he did up top. Both are great ways to use chainsaws and manage a place, but with incorporating hinge cuts, really hitting the canopy, you're gonna get a lot. If you're gonna get carried better. with a chainsaw, you're gonna to wanna to do more of that. Okay, like releasing Yeah, oaks just and releasing stuff. oaks, Correct. general crop tree release. This is, you know, there's part of the world loves this, part of the world hates this. And so it's like, it's important to note that this, this is, is a really pretty beneficial. small area yeah, actually, yeah, 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 where yeah. you did this. I mean, it's like 30, 40 yards wide. Uh, right. But generally, we try to do at least a half acre to really open it up so we know we're going to get a really good plant response because of the sunlight. But due to time's sake, we didn't. But open this up, and now it's like there's deer bedded in there. Mm -hmm. Almost every day, you know, pretty consistent, there's deer down there. So you do this in very key locations where you're wanting to what we say is stashed here during daylight hours where, yeah. where you want to want to put them out so you can navigate your farm and hunt it but you don't do this everywhere right this is very key specific locations and we're gonna put a few of these babies up over some of these tops because these guys say that the deer will come right in here and start that's right browsing on these that's the deer food right there bloom deer food yeah. i believe that i'll post links to as many things as possible in the description below where you can follow these guys where you can talk to them and watch their content like we chatted earlier the worst thing to do is nothing right we're managing yeah. disturbance driven creatures and so when we're out here active even if you cut what you think is the wrong tree you're opening up the canopy yeah. you'll get a response from that and that will probably relate positively to deer turkey 
So, so we got a 15 or 20 acre field out there that's basically useless to a turkey. Yeah. yeah. I mean, with all that fescue and stuff in it. Yeah. And that's going to be all good habitat mm -hmm. moving forward. That's right. As long as we take care of it. Hopefully you all learned something. I know I did. Did you learn anything, Ted? Yes, sir. Did you learn what aromatic sumac looks like? It looks like this here. That's right. <laughs> well, well done.